Hi, everyone. I'm Katrina from Index Ventures, and I'm so happy to see you all here. I think the Builder Studio is a great concept, and uh, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to tell you a little bit more about how we at Index think about rewarding talent over the next 30 minutes. And so Index Ventures has been around for 25 years, and just as long, we've been really thinking about compensation uh, and how our portfolio companies should think about compensation and rewarding talent. And so, 10 years ago, uh, Dominic, our VP talent of, and, uh, of Talent and Insight, who was actually supposed to be here today but unfortunately couldn't make it, uh, has started to put together a database and benchmarking on employee options and how to reward employees. And we've been helping our portfolio companies on this ever since. And then five years ago, actually decided to open source it. So because we wanted everyone in the European and also, frankly, in the global ecosystem to benefit on some of the benchmarks that we've put together. And uh, so over the next 30 minutes, I just want to walk you through a little bit of the general concepts, how we've been thinking about it. And uh, hopefully, you can take away something for, for your own company. Uh, briefly about Index, so we were started 25 years ago, we're a global fund headquartered in San Francisco and London, and uh, our multi-stage fund investing from a million to a hundred million euros in ticket size, so from the early stage to the growth stage. Uh, thematically, we're very generalist, so we're, uh, we've been investing both in consumer and B2B enterprise companies, backing companies such as Personia in Germany, uh, Roblox, Adyen, Supercell here in Finland, Figma uh, and Robinhood in their seed rounds and continue to do so. And as part of the launch of our Origin Seed Fund earlier this year, uh, we've revised our option guidance program to really look at how should you think about it at the early and the seed stage uh, already. And that's what I want to take you through today. So what we've seen is there's been a tremendous change in the fundraising landscape over the last couple of years, right? And that's not to say that fundraising is easy, but what we've seen is with the influx of capital, what's really become a bottleneck is human capital. And so there's like many dimensions to think through this is like, how do you attract talent when you only have limited amounts to pay? How do you retain talent when other companies have deeper pockets? How do you motivate talent if you can maybe not deliver exactly the same benefits as others? And how do you align talent when people come from all different avenues and geographies? And we've really seen two avenues to do that. So the first one Nina has already talked about just now, and that's mission and culture. And that's something that you as founders are thinking through every day. And that's really your superpower because um, that's what that's why people are frankly joining you, right? Like they want to like work on disruptive ideas. They want to have an impact. They want to follow through on the mission that you're building. And so that's something that you're thinking through every day anyways already. But the other component of uh, superpower that you have is the financial upside that you can provide your employees. And so even if you maybe can't pay the best salaries on the market, you have employee options to let them participate in your journey and hopefully provide them upside uh, in the future. And so that's what you can do through employee option plans. And uh, I'm going to walk you through a little bit kind of the tenants that we've seen there. And What's been really interesting is if you compare the Europe, uh, Europe and the US and employee options, it's been striking to see quite a big gap uh, historically. So the US has uh, usually started out with an average of 13% set aside for employees, whereas uh, Europe has historically started around 10. And then an interesting curve that you've seen is that over time, the US companies have actually increased their employee option pool. So as they raised more funding rounds, they didn't just top it up to uh, make up for a dilution that they've been incurring, but they really increased the option pool to give more uh, share to their employees. And so at kind of a late Series D round, they were roughly at around 22% that was allocated to employees. Whereas historically, five years ago in Europe, we've seen that they were around half. So what happened in Europe was we started with around 10% of an employee option pool, and then rather than increasing it, it stayed flat and it was literally just topped up to account for a dilution. And so when we crunched the data again this year, what's been really great to see is this, that there's been a tremendous shift more to uh, the US model, where European companies still start around the same entry point, around 10%, but then have also adopted that model that they increase their option pool over time, which uh, in our uh, view has been really critical. 
Now you're going to ask, why is there still a gap to Europe, but why have we also come closer to close it? And there's really four avenues that we've seen that have made an impact here. The first is government policy. So the UK and the Baltics and also France have actually made an amazing progress when it comes to how they tax employee options and employee incentivization programs. And so there, they've like in the Baltics and the UK and in France, we actually now have better standards than we have in the US. And uh, on the other hand, though, in most of the other European countries, there's still quite a lot of room for progress. And uh, we continue lobbying for that, actually. And I'm going to tell you how can, you can help us with that in a second. But uh, we. Uh, Index actually created this no, not optional campaign where we've put together benchmarks that and best practices to promote um, these programs and favorable legislation with countries that haven't made that change so far. But with kind of that like unfavorable regulation, that still produces part of the gap. Secondly, we're still working all together, I think, on a mindset shift. So I think investors, if they've been around for a long time, they've seen the value of, of incentivizing employees and, bring, and how core that has been to bringing key talent early on. And what we've seen is that now also with founders, there's been a shift. And this is not to pick on you in the audience. I'm sure this is top of mind for you already. But I think it's a hard trade-off when you know that like, maybe 5% of an additional option pool will like, dilute you and like, your financial upside in the company. And what I just want to encourage you all is that when we at Index Ventures look at early stage companies, the almost most important thing next to you as founders is your ability to hire. And so when we back early stage companies, one of the key success factors that we've been seeing is like, what's the caliber of talent that you've been able to attract early on? And so I just want to encourage you to, in your mindset, be open and generous to pay a little bit more in terms of uh, employee options when there's people that you really want to bring in, because it will make a difference, not only in the success in your company, but potentially also in your fundraising success. Thirdly, we've, we've already seen a change in risk appetite. As you all know for sure is that often you need to walk uh, employers really carefully through what does employee options have even mean, what does that mean financially, what, uh, why should you choose that as a component next to your salary. And what's been uh, very interesting to see, actually, is that uh, where there's been more positive outcomes, we've seen more appetite to be rewarded in uh, employee options. And so, for example, in the UK, where we've seen the most number of successful exits, uh, the, there's been more of an appeal of employee options, because I think there just needs to be more successful examples that this is worth something, and this is not just something to decrease your salary, but this is this means something, right? And so there also, I'd encourage you all in the audience to keep on walking through your employees, what that could actually mean, what does that mean at different valuations? And I'm gonna show you an example in a second. And then lastly, I think there is also just a lack of data. And so uh, when you don't know what the baseline is and your employees don't know what the baseline is, then it's also hard to find the right setup. And uh, with kind of open sourcing all of our benchmarking and data, we hope that uh, we were able to contribute a little bit to that. Now, most of you or many of you might be early stage founders and so you have the opportunity to really right size your ease up and you have the opportunity to set it up right at, uh, from the get go in a correct way. And so what we recommend you there, so the gray line you see kind of how it used to be in Europe in 2016, the red and the black line are what we recommend you today. And there is really two things that uh, I want you to take away from that. First, ideally already start higher than the 10%. We've seen that uh, technical companies might even want to start as high as 15% because as you know, key technical talent is so hard to find. So you want to set apart a little bit more equity to bring in that key talent and then be ready to increase it over time rather than having it stay flat. So that ideally kind of, I mean, at a late stage where you might already be thinking about an IPO, your employees own around 20% of the company. What I would also mention next to kind of that difference between more like technically oriented companies versus uh, more kind of business model innovation oriented companies is that if you're a solo founder, we've seen that it's helpful if you increase your option pool even a little bit further, roughly by 2.5% to make up for kind of that you can bring in even more um, key talent into this. 
So I mentioned it already, but if you want to play around with it and think about what's the best strategy, then you can go actually online um, and look at our option uh, plan where you really per stage, per um, profile, per geography, per business model can get um, recommendations around kind of what salary like might be the average, what option plan might be the right one to pick for. And so I'd really encourage you to play around with it. It's comprehensive data from all across the world that we've been trying to put in the most UX friendly format possible. But I've brought a little example uh, with me today to just walk you through how you can think around that. So in that quadrant, you can see we usually tend to calculate option grants as a percentage of the annual salary, which, for example, say that if you have a senior tech person that you want to bring in, you might pay them around, on average, 120 or 125,000 euros. And we've seen that then, for example, an average for that is to give them another 85% of their annual salary in option grants, which would roughly translate into 100,000 euros. And so that's the broad concept, like how we've been thinking around that. Now, again, there's like a couple of points that you want to look at. First of all, that uh, it depends, again, on how strong your technical DNA is. And if there's really specific talent, say, for example, also in crypto or so, you might want to increase that a little further to get them into your company. But also, we've been seeing a risk premium for like the first one to three hires. By them joining you so early, they might ask for being rewarded for that in uh, I mean, additional option grants um, from a percentage perspective. And so you see kind of that the more senior that talent gets, also the like heavier that option component should be, which naturally makes sense as they like really should share kind of in uh, the willingness to drive you to success. Then kind of how that would look like potentially at post seed, so we've calculated this now really for the early stage, is say you've made 14 hires and first and and I should actually say one, we've seen that on average, uh, you would give away around 7% of your cap table to uh, early stage employees post the seed round. Uh, so that say like if you have a um, average valuation of uh, 18 million, uh, 16 million post, uh, post your seed round, that would translate in roughly 1.1 million in euros. And uh, you see kind of how that's been un allocated and that there is like a heavy kind of weighing towards early stage hires and, and technical hires. What that you then want to do next, and again, that's something that you can find online, but is to help them think through what that actually means. Now you've uh, allocated around a million euros in value pre-seed or at seed stage to your early stage employees, but what does that actually mean? And so when you then help them calculate it through including dilution, you can see that, for example, for that senior technical hire that we were speaking about, you um, gave them 100,000 euros in stock options. Now, if you reach that uh, $1 billion in valuation, that suddenly translates into 3.6 million of value for that employee alone, right? And I think if you help them think through that and help them paint that future picture and what like you're all striving towards, that can be immensely powerful. And so whenever you discuss employee options with your employees, I'd really encourage you to map that out and tell them, hey, look, this is what this means and this is like what we're trying to get to and that it will be really, really meaningful, which in turn then hopefully helps you to uh, you know, make the, the value of em employee options really clear and make that a strong component next to the salary. So then kind of now we've talked through how the ESOP should look like and uh, what it should roughly amount to. We always encourage you to set it up as early as possible uh, because the advantage of it being that there is no room for misunderstanding. Uh, it's a lever for you to bring key talent early because it already exists and there are no insecurities around it. And uh, it's frankly also usually easier in Europe to set it up right from the get-go when you uh, can still take like a template and you have like a clean setup, etc. But 
we do understand that that's not always possible. So when there is no way for you to set it up uh, pre at the pre-seed stage, and um, or when, if it's like a monetary topic, then there is a couple of aspects that I would like you to take away that uh, you can think of um, when you only are able to um, implement it later. And so first and foremost, the key is that you're then very clear about kind of the conditions of that employee grant. So you want to make sure that you clearly align on is that pre-valuation, is that pre-round, is that post-round, because that will obviously have an effect on dilution. You will ideally want to uh, backdate the vesting to the start date of the employee so that that employee is not punished for you only installing an option plan later. And you want to um, be sure that you really note down everything that's been discussed and agreed on so that there is like no misunderstandings when you actually set it up. So key takeaway here, set up your employee is up as early as possible. And then when you, um, there is like, I mean, we have a book where you can read all of that, but I wanted to mention that as well, kind of what is a couple of key things to think about when you think about um, setting up your ease up. First and foremost, uh, the concept of vesting. And you're all familiar with vesting. Typically, you see uh, a one-year cliff with 25% straight line vesting year over year, so a four-year vesting schedule overall. One thing that we've been seeing more and more and that uh, we'd encourage you to think about is actually backloaded vesting. So that maybe in the first year only 10% vest, then 20%, then 30%, then 40%. The reason being that in kind of the competitive talent market that we are in today, retention is becoming so important that you want to have some lever to encourage retention beyond the mission and culture that you're building. But so we've been seeing that more and more. Secondly, uh, strike price. With the strike price, which is the price at which the employees can actually buy their options then, we encourage you to go as low as possible. We know that that's not possible everywhere. In the UK and in the Baltics, it's possible to set it like arbitrarily to like your desire. But it does vary by country. And so if you don't have the option to um, formally set it like as, as low, you can always think about a phantom share program, which effectively is like a mimic option program, but is really a bonus. And so there, there's no strike price. You can uh, just arbitrarily set it to the levels that you want to. What is important about the phantom share program that I would also encourage you to think about is that there, since there is no strike price at which the employee then buys the options and maybe has some skin in the game, you, we've also seen people thinking about capping the upside when an employee leaves. So you want to be generous there, but if an employee leaves, you could think about, for example, capping the upside that they get from the options at like 2x, 3x, 4x the valuation that they've been leaving at so that they're really... Um, rewarded for the work they've done, but then not necessarily participated in all the like um, upside that has been created potentially when that employee has left already. Thirdly is levers. So we encourage you to be generous there as well and only use bad lever clauses if someone is terminated for cause. The reason being, all your former employees will be out in the wild and talking about you. And so you want them to leave with the best feeling possible. You want them to be your references, your advocators, uh, and you want them to speak positively about you as a company. And that's just much more rewarding when you like um, basically allow them to leave uh, kind of with upside rather than like them leaving with a bad taste. So I would encourage you about that as well. What a lot of you have been probably thinking about or hearing about when it comes to key talent is accelerated vesting. So the idea that when you as a company get bought, the like shares of, that, uh, of specific key hires vests fully um, so that they don't need to stay like, under that new um, uh, ownership. And, and what we would encourage you to think about is to limit that as much as possible, because it's really like a poison pill for the potential acquirer. You have to think about it that way. The company that uh, wants to buy you buys you partly because of the talent that you've built up. And if they see that the key talent uh, that you've been bringing on is suddenly fully vested, they know that there is a high risk to leave and there is probably additional financial 
efforts required to have them stay because you likely need to like set up a new option program that incentivizes to them stay. So I would be very careful in, uh, in handing out accelerated vesting terms. You obviously want to be consistent in uh, the clauses and the requirements that you go, uh, give out in your grant schemes because people talk and the last thing you want is that somebody finds out this person has accelerated vesting and this not or uh, this person has gotten this. So you want to be as consistent as possible, which we know is hard when you really want to get this one key higher, but just to encourage you to stick to that principle. And then lastly, communication is everything. So uh, you want to, um, what we've actually been seeing is really, really helpful is that you have own, if you have ownership for all, so that anybody in the team has at least like a small stake in the business. Because what that allows you to do is to address everybody in a joint forum rather than saying, okay, like let's say half of the group is gonna meet and we're gonna talk about it. You will like empower everyone as owners when you fundraise, you can celebrate it and say, hey, look, there is upside for you. You can uh, just kind of be inclusive of everyone and celebrate as one. And so we encourage you uh, to, to think about just handing out um, employee grants to literally everyone in the organization. And the other part in communication is, to my point earlier, that you kind of really walk them through the concept of what that means and what this is worth. And so what we've been seeing is really helpful there is using cap table software that lists kind of the grants, uh, companies like Carta or Seed Legals or others that not only help you to like have the overview, but that often like visually allow you to show to your employees, this is what this means, this is what... Um, uh, this will turn to, if we reach this valuation, this is what the, the new fundraise now means to you. So I um, would really encourage you to think about uh, that. So with that, I'm actually already uh, almost at the end of my talk. Um, you can, if you thought this was interesting, you can really go down the rabbit hole on our website and go through all these resources. So as I said, we've wrote a book about rewarding talent specifically, uh, which you can find online, which goes through all the concepts that I've just explained. We've actually also written a book about international expansion to the US and international expansion to Europe, which go in depth through concept what you want to think about maybe when it comes to employee incentivization uh, when you expand internationally. And my colleague Sophia is actually going to talk about this tomorrow. Then you want to play around with the option plan where you can really fine tune like what geography, what stage, what um, uh, function you want to hire for and what the average for this uh, like company and role will be. And then, as I mentioned on the Outlook, I would really encourage you to sign our, our manifesto for better employee ownership regulation and government policy in Europe. So if you find that on our website, it's the not optional campaign, and we continue to be pushing in all European countries to get to best practices as we've seen it being adopted in the Baltics and the UK. And so I'd encourage you to take a look at that. Um, so with that, I'll leave you to it. I'm happy. I think we have time for maybe one or two questions. Which uh, I mean, Dominic, my colleague, is probably much better suited to uh, answer. But I'm happy to to give my best at it. And uh, yeah, just be proud of the companies that you're building. We at Index are. We've never been excited. We've never been more excited about the startup uh, ecosystem in Europe. We can't wait to see what you guys are building, and we hope we get to back some of you. Thank you.